For about the last three years, I've been exploring enterprise GPUs and their usefulness when it comes to gaming. But there's a bigger picture technology that I'm equally as excited about, and uh, it just might change the way you work with computers. Today's video is brought to you by craftcomputing.store, the letters I, P, and A, and viewers like you. Or at least it could be. If you like the things we do here on Craft Computing, consider joining the Patreon. Every contribution helps keep power onto my lights, my server rack, and my beer fridge. Seriously, I would not be able to do the things that I do without the amazing support from my patrons. As little as $1 a month gets you exclusive access to my Discord server, which my amazing patrons from all over the world keep lively at all hours of the day. You can chat with me or the other hosts from our weekly live show, Talking Heads, or simply lurk and catch the ebb and flow of the Craft Computing community. Visit patreon.com slash craftcomputing to sign up today. That's patreon.com slash craftcomputing. And again, thanks for watching. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. What started as experimentation with headless GPUs for gaming quickly evolved into an obsession with headless computing. Though, to be honest, that obsession had always been there. I just didn't have the means to actually make it happen. When I talk about headless computing, cloud gaming, or distributed desktop, I'm actually talking about a concept known as VDI, or Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. And it's a technology I have had a long and involved history with, even without utilizing enterprise GPUs for video acceleration or decoding. If you have a home lab, or you've worked in IT for any length of time, you're likely accustomed to remoting into your servers or virtual machines. But more often than not, you'll likely connect with something like SSH, VNC, through your server's IPMI port, or even with something like Windows Remote Desktop. While these are all fairly simple methods to access headless machines, you'll typically only connect to these to manage the systems themselves. That is, configuring web servers, assigning file permissions, or other fairly remedial tasks. But what if you want to run a service or application on a server that has access to more power than your PC or the laptop that you're using? Maybe you need to run an application in a secure environment. Maybe your remote machine has software or features that aren't available on your local system. What about local access to resources on a completely different network than the one you're connected to? That is where virtual desktop infrastructure comes into play. Like I mentioned in the intro, I've been working at unlocking the gaming potential of enterprise GPUs for about the last three years, and I've had some amazing success in that area. Go check out my 12 Gamers 1 CPU video to see what I'm talking about. The reason I've been focusing on gaming that entire time is fairly simple. It's the most demanding service that you can ask of a VDI system. In fact, that's why most of my industry focuses on gaming for benchmarking. It's because games are able to use pretty much 100% of the horsepower that you're able to throw at them, and they will expose any potential bottlenecks in your system. They're also among the most intense workloads when it comes to video encode, 3D rendering, CPU compute, storage access, and sensitivity to latency. While some more professional users might balk at the idea of testing with games, there's really no application that will stress the system quite as much. But what are some use cases for VDI, and how do I use it here in my home server rack? Let's start off with some of the earliest situations that I deployed VDI, and it's a situation unfortunately most corporate IT professionals are very familiar with, and that is local Java applications. Over my nearly 18 years of working in professional IT in some way, shape, or form, I have never encountered more of a pain in the ass than Java applications for accessing critical services. They can be local applets or web-based dependencies, but Java was the bane of my existence through the 2000s and most of the 2010s. HP integrated lights out controllers, RAID controllers, Johnson controls for HVAC, Dell iDRAC controllers, random NVR or access control software, all of them use Java as a front end on the client system at best, or require Java to run these server side components at worst. And most of the time, it would refuse to run at all after random Windows updates, or unless you had specific revisions of Java installed. Being an IT and network administrator, right around 2012, I had finally had enough of fighting Java on local workstations. So I deployed my first professional instance of VDI, a Windows XP virtual machine complete with terminal services and Microsoft App V specifically built to run Java and the Johnson Controls administration software. And nothing else. 
By 2012, Windows XP had received nearly every update that it was going to, and we had internally established which versions of Java were the most stable for running Johnson's control software. So instead of trying to get the applet up and running on Windows Vista or Windows 7 laptops, we virtualized a Windows XP 32-bit environment that had network access only to Johnson control devices and our local client network. Now, I already know what you're thinking, because quite honestly, I was thinking the same thing at the time. How did I expect users to remote into a desktop other than their own local machine, use Johnson Control software in that remote environment, and then not forget to log out of that remote access machine and then access their desktop for things like internet and local applications? That was through a service known as Microsoft App V, or Virtual Application Server. On the XP Virtual Machine, terminal services allowed for multiple users to log into the OS at the same time, rather than the one user at a time VM limitation that Windows normally has. Users connected with remote desktop protocol, but under RDP, you specify an application to launch. Rather than connecting directly to a Windows desktop, RDP would only show the remote application in its own window, and it actually functioned exactly like a local application to the end user. Now, there are some massive benefits to running applications like this. First, let's say the user isn't on your local LAN. A quick VPN and remote desktop connection later, and they'd get the same fast and local access to all resources as the application server. If the user is connecting to an application such as AutoCAD or Photoshop, they can also take advantage of the server's more powerful hardware. You also get dead simple version control for both the OS and client software, without having to manage each and every client machine. One of the biggest obstacles I encountered when deploying control software for Access Control, HVAC, IPMI, or just about any other Java-based dependency from the first 15 years of the new millennium was ensuring that Windows and Java had the correct versions required by your intended software. And finally, you get added security, as even if the user is off-site, the data stays 100% contained within your local LAN and server, further limiting any risks for users working from home or on the road. Again, as much as I like to focus on gaming for VDI, I have a couple use cases here at home that I use almost daily, starting with a less obvious use case, CNC machining. In my garage, I have a fairly basic CNC router, and recently I've been doing quite a bit of laser engraving. And while I have an offline controller for playing back the G-code, I much prefer being able to monitor the machine in real time, both with a camera feed as well as feedback from the machine itself. Now, an early solution I came up with was just building a small PC that was dedicated to running my CNC and I could remote into it. But I had tons of issues with the Wi-Fi dropping out in my garage, which meant I needed to plug in a monitor and keyboard to reconnect the PC, and it wound up being more trouble than it was worth. That's when, like a bolt of lightning, it dawned on me, I have an entire 42U rack filled with servers in my garage. So why wasn't I virtualizing the control PC? A quick buildup of a Windows 11 virtual machine and a USB port pass through later, and I was up and running. Now I'm able to VNC into my CNC controller, set up my toolpaths or laser engraver cuts, and hit run, all from my laptop. I'm able to check in on the job at any time, and I don't have to have a dedicated PC just for running the occasional CNC project. Of course, that has been a use case for decades, so let's talk about some more modern and practical use cases for VDI, and why I've been so excited to explore the enterprise GPU space over the last number of years. Gaming on your own personal cloud server is definitely a lot of fun, but it can actually save you money, especially if you're considering buying a Steam Deck or some of the other Windows-based gaming handhelds that have been hitting the market lately. While those handhelds have made a massive leap forward over the last year or so, picking up something like an Ein Odin can make a lot of sense if you pair it with an old enterprise GPU, like a Tesla M40, a Tesla P4, or even an old GTX 1070 that you pulled out of your gaming station. But what about non-gaming applications? Are there any practical uses for GPU-accelerated VMs in your server rack other than the passive applications like Plex or NVR encoding? As some of you may know, I've been contracting out some of my video editing for over a year now, and I've been hosting a Windows 10 virtual machine for that exact purpose. It runs on Proxmox, and I've also passed through a Tesla M60 8GB GPU to it. Connecting through Parsec from my laptop or having my editor remote in from his house drops us onto a Windows 10 desktop with full video acceleration, along with local access to my video editing NAS. 
Now, keep in mind that video editing remotely typically means transferring either proxy footage or hundreds of gigabytes worth of video to the remote editor. Video projects for craft computing can reach easily between 500 and 750 gigabytes each, which is far more than I can reasonably upload on my home internet connection with just 50 megabit up. Instead, Rhett just remotes into our editing VM, launches Premiere, and edits videos from wherever he happens to be. With the Tesla M60, the VM has access to 8GB of VRAM, along with NVIDIA NVENC for encode and decode. The virtual machine is able to utilize that GPU horsepower to not only smoothly playback ProRes LT422 video in Premiere at full speed, but also encode a stream of the desktop session, providing low latency access to the remote client. So instead of transferring literally terabytes worth of data back and forth between the two of us every week, I can simply upload the raw footage to my NAS and then we can begin editing immediately from any PC. Solutions like this have also been very popular in the design industry, whether it be for AutoCAD, photo or video editing, or any other parallel use cases that require local access to large data sets and low latency access from users. While enterprise-grade GPUs do cost thousands of dollars in hardware, and sometimes even more in software and licensing, it's a cost that can make a lot of sense when a company is comparing equipping 10 digital artists with workstation-grade laptops or full CAD workstations to every mechanical engineer. The missing pieces to all of this, at least when it comes to home labs and to small and medium-sized businesses alike, has been affordability and availability. While I've had some amazing success with vGPU unlock scripts and direct PCI Express pass-through of end-of-life enterprise GPUs, these solutions are still workarounds to the officially supported offerings from AMD or NVIDIA. NVIDIA requires annual licensing equal to or greater the price of their supported GPUs, meaning the official cost of entry for a business to virtualize even one GPU is nearly $6,000 for the first year. And while AMD boosts their solution as a license and recurring cost free, they offer no support outside of their OEM partners. And those OEMs all require service contracts and original purchased equipment to allow access to drivers. Not exactly the best solutions from either company when it comes to repurposing hardware. Now there is some hope that Intel will bring some much needed competition to this market with their Flex Enterprise GPUs but I have had it confirmed that this will be an enterprise-only feature, meaning SRIOV and bifurcation will not be coming to ARC or ARC Pro GPUs. At least, not yet anyway. Leave a comment down below with your use case as a small business or home labber, and I'll be sure to pass them along next time I talk to Intel's GPU team. While virtual desktop infrastructure has a ton of potential at changing the workflow of users and companies around the world, the hardware behind it is still seen as not needed by the general public and remains a very pricey add-on available only to those with the deepest of pockets. VDI is a technology that I have been passionate about for around 20 years or so, though admittedly when I started using it, it didn't even have a name yet. But even when a much younger Jeff was sitting on the floor of a one bedroom apartment in the early 2000s with three desktops running headless and remoting into it from my Sony VIA laptop, that was still a form of VDI. When it comes to VDI, I'm hoping for there to be a breakthrough on both affordability and availability sometime in the near future, because the use cases for distributed desktops are endless, from video editing and playback, to photo editing, to mechanical design, or even if you just want to reuse an older video card to play some games on your cell phone or your M1 MacBook, it's a technology that I desperately want to trickle down into consumer parts, because people like you will find new and exciting ways to utilize it. And yes, this is Cyberpunk 2077 running on my MacBook M1 at 4K with ray tracing enabled. And it's running well over 60 FPS. But it's not running on this. It's running on my server. But in the meantime, I guess we'll still have to rely on hacks and single device pass-through until a better solution comes along. But that's going to do it for me in this one. If you're interested in the journey that I've taken with VDI and my cloud gaming servers, make sure to check out the playlist down in the video description. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.
Beer for today is a sizable one in more ways than one. From Epic Brewing, this is the Big Bad Baptiste Double Chocolate Double Peanut Butter Cup. Uh, clocks in at 11.5% and brewed in Salt Lake City, Utah and Denver, Colorado, both. Uh, this one bottle was $17 and I've had their standard, but not their double chocolate peanut butter. So I'm pretty excited. That is an interesting aroma, much more toffee-like than chocolate and peanut butter. It's a lot lighter than I'd expect. I, I'd expect that aroma to be much, much richer. Remember folks, change your oil every 3,000 miles. You know, unless your manufacturer recommends something else, which most of them do. There is neither chocolate nor peanut butter, at least at first glance. I'm concerned. Are you concerned? I'm concerned. We'll see how this one turns out. It's been in my fridge for a while. I don't know if those flavors are just missing or if they've been completely mellowed out by the malt and... I hate to say it, but rice that's in this beer. Um, it's not bad. It is just completely not what I expected when I tried this beer. Uh, when it says double chocolate, double peanut butter, you have certain flavor profiles in your mind, and this certainly wasn't it. Taking a reset on this. I said reset, not Reese's. Taking a reset on this, um, it's not a bad stout. It's not a bad stout at all. I'm actually quite enjoying it now that I've literally power cycled my brain from trying to dig for chocolate and peanut butter. Because frankly, they're just not there. Um, so right away, if you were looking for a peanut butter cup inspired imperial stout, I don't know if this one just aged too long. This is a 2020 release of this particular beer. Like I said, it's been in my fridge for quite some time, but it has been kept at cellar temperature the entire time. Um, most of the flavors have kind of diffused out. Now that being said, it's still a really good stout. There's not a lot of, of roastiness or coffee or dark chocolate or, or any of those like super dark, rich black flavors in it. Um, there is a little bit of an earthiness to it. There's a little bit of, kind of like I said, right on the nose, there's a little bit of like a toffee crunch kind of, kind of flavor and aroma to it. A little bit more nuttiness, but definitely not peanut butter. Uh, incredibly smooth for 11.5%. And definitely a complex beer. But is it a double chocolate, double peanut butter cup stout? No. Cheers. <laughs>